We're all aware that the concept of masked vigilantes is cool, right? We've all gotten to that, you know, Batman, Robin, Nightwing, all that sort of thing. Cool. So let's go look at some of the earlier stuff that all that was based on. In particular, looking at Zorro, we're actually looking at a modern day retelling of Zorro, but I will talk about some of the original stuff. And specifically, we're looking at the novel Zorro, or as the spine likes to call itself, Zorro the novel. And if you're thinking that a book that can't decide what its title is, is a bad sign, he'd be right. Zorro first appeared in the serialized novel The Curse of Capistrano in 1919, which was so popular that it was turned into a film the very next year entitled The Mark of Zorro, which did so astoundingly well that the book was reprinted under that same name in 1924, and that movie was remade in 1940. Presumably everyone's aware of the concept of Zorro. You know, he wears black, he's got a mask over the top half of his face, he wears the sombrero and the cape, and he fights for justice and defends people who can't defend themselves. He's like a proto-Batman. You know, he runs around in the 1800s, he's got a rapier and a whip, and rides a horse named Tornado. You know, he's like Batman but cool in Spanish. Zorro is of course actually Don Diego Vega, a rich fop who appears to have more money than sense, something else that Batman decided to copy from him. And he fights the villainous Captain Ramon and Sergeant Gonzalez with his lover Lolita and his mute servant Bernardo. I'm trying not to do a bad Spanish accent when I pronounce those names, because it's just bad. Now, The Curse of Capistrato is pretty good, and I'm going to put a link in the description to where you can just read that for free. Because The Curse of Capistrato and the 1920 film The Mark of Zorro are public domain, and you can get them for free and watch them and read them and enjoy that content amazingly. And that's why I'm not reviewing The Curse of Capistrano from 1919, because y you don't need my recommendation about going out and buying a copy of that. You can just read it for yourself for free without breaking any laws of any sort. And then if you find a really nice looking copy of it and you decide that you want it, you can just get that. And I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say anything. I enjoyed it. But here we go. Now, since the 1920s, Zorro as a character has appeared in over 40 films, 11 TV series, dozens of written works by other authors, six radio dramas, and nearly a dozen comic series, with nine video games and 65 known stage productions, including musicals and ballets. Not to mention a Zorro role-playing game in 2001, which was apparently terrible. But, as a side note to that, there is a Zorro RPG which was recently funded on Kickstarter and it looks like it might be okay. So if you see that around, feel free to pick it up because it might be good. Uh, it might be bad, but I don't know, it looks alright. So Novel the Zorro by Isabel Allende is released in 2005. It's a Zorro origin tale. It deals with his parents, it deals with his childhood, it deals with him growing up and learning to fence and getting a sense of justice and appreciation of different cultures and, you know, then briefly, very briefly, and over like 80 or 90 pages, uh, has him being Zorro in California in the 1800s. Now, the characterization of Diego de la Vega is pretty well done, I feel. Allende captures that awkward teenage boy phase where he's acting out to impress a girl but he just comes off as annoying. She pushes the time frame forward to the mid to late 1800s instead of the early 1800s and spends enough time talking about the effects of colonialism and greater political changes to do with Napoleon that this is really more a work of historical fiction that happens to feature Zorro rather than just a Zorro tale. Now, before we get any deeper into this, I'm going to say straight up, I do not recommend this book at all. Um, I can and will recommend that you look into the history of the character because I found that infinitely more fascinating than the book itself. And I can highly recommend that you read The Curse of Capistrano for free, link in the description, um, as a feature specifically of where Batman and V for Vendetta and the Watchmen and that sort of thing came from. But this book in particular, no, definitely not. Now if we bring up our still fairly ineffective reading difficulty scale up here, the novel Zorro is sitting below the Silmarillion, which, not that hard, because it's the only other thing that I've reviewed so far. But, Silmarillion was difficult because it was a book of lore, rather than a book of stories. And when it told stories, it was excellent. Novel Zorro the is a difficult read. Not because it's 
got high concepts or because it's a book of lore or anything, but because it's not well written. And that's... I don't want to dwell on that too much because writing a novel is very, very hard and I doubt that my writing is any better at all. But on top of that, this is originally written in Spanish and translated over to English, so a lot of that difficulty in reading it could be from the translation rather than from the author herself. But I would still expect the translator to, you know, work it a bit better. Either way, it's not very well written. But that aside, I've got some pretty major personal issues with this book, and I'm going to go into those right now. Now, first off, I realized that this was written from the perspective of someone who was alive at the time, aka the 1800s. But the novel itself was published in 2005, and it's got a really strange relationship with race and gender. So Allende clearly attempts to give her female characters more to do than just be prizes to be won and damsels in distress, but I feel like her approach was poor. Now aside from the obvious self-insert character who hashtag isn't like other girls, female characters in this book are either subservient to or obsessed with men. They break stereotypical gender roles by assuming male ones and just being treated by the story like a man until the plot demands that suddenly everyone has to go, wait, no, you can't do that because you're a woman. Um, it's, it, which isn't great. Well, the, other than that, they could be villains in positions of power, which subtly implies that a woman with power will become more villainous than their male counterparts. That or they're someone from a different culture and therefore not bound by our traditional subservient female gender roles, which might be nice if not for the weird racism. Broadly, the racial groups dealt with in this book are the Spanish, the Native Americans, the Romani, freed slaves from various parts of Africa now living in New Orleans, and generic natives from Panama, and the less said about the generic natives from Panama, the better. Now, the Native Americans throughout this book are generally referred to as Indians, because of course they are, and they're generally depicted as being unable to help themselves and needing, you know, these white Spanish people to come and be like, no, 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 you can fight back. I, I believe in you. Quickly, do these things which I say, and oh, look, now things are better. And they are, they're all shown as having these weird magical rituals, which have very real effects, um, and they have some concept of all Native Americans having some sort of low-level telepathy, which just feels weird. Really weird. And the depiction of Native Americans feels like it gets worse, particularly when Zorro actually turns up in his full get-up and, you know, falls into that whole white savior trope. You know, <laughs> the, um, the plot at the end of the book relies... Uh, has Zoro relying heavily on Native Americans to carry out his plan, which of course any of them could have done by themselves, but they just needed him to inspire them into action. Now with the freed slaves, there's a very obvious attempt to empower the characters and point out that they're not slaves, but then they go and act like slaves anyway. And there's some general misrepresentations of voodoo rituals, which are again shown to have real, though minor, otherworldly effects, and yeah, that's a... Uh, that's a recurring trope that all of the white Christian people have, like, the grounded reality stuff, and then all these other cultures have their, ooh, their weird mystical rituals, which all have magical effects, and yet the, there's, there's that weird disconnect of, yes, I am praying to a goat, and therefore I am being given goat powers, and ah, uh, yes, you are praying to Jesus and have no powers. It's a weird weird thing, especially when so much of the book is grounded in, you know, history. And the Romani are of course referred to as gypsies, and Allende goes into great detail about them, but it's a sort of detail that feels like it's been learned from a book. And as a, as a person of Romani descent, whose grandmother has spent much of her life trying to piece together uh, the tales and customs and pass them on to myself and uh, my siblings, it doesn't ring true, all the stuff that she's saying coming out with. It just sort of feels insulting. And of course, there's lots of passages about, oh, no one trusts them because they're all horrible people and they're all stealing all the things, and oh no, they're going to rape and kill me, and of course, they're like, oh, this one can tell the future because of course, he's got a crystal ball, but oh, not, not the Christians. Ugh. 
On top of all this, you would expect at least that the descriptions of, like, the sword play would be interesting. You know, it's Zoro, he's got his sword out, it's gotta have some, like, Princess Bride sort of back and forth. But it's not, it's unengaging, it's boring, it feels... I don't know how to describe how much I dislike this, but I am not a fan at all. Part of it might have been because I was heavily sedated going through all this, because if you paid attention to Instagram or anything, I was in hospital recently. But I was having to force myself to finish this book, and the book I picked up immediately afterwards, which I am going to do a video on at some point, but not until I finish the entire series, because I want to do it as a big block, I devoured, like, a quarter of the book in a single sitting, whereas this I would have to sit and force myself to go through, and that is the biggest sign that I can tell you straight up that this is not great. So I don't recommend it, and it definitely does not get a spot in my shelf. And even if I did recommend it and uh, want it to be in my shelf, I wouldn't keep it anyway, because I borrowed it from my sister, because she was like, hey, you should read this, it's not bad. Uh, sorry, sis. It's not, it's not good. It's not good at all. Anyway. Bye.